we have uh, a few questions. Uh, I'll try to pose them and uh, uh, let's see how they are. First of all, there was a question from London regarding the systemic antibiotics. London, are you on? Yeah, I am here. Yeah, so what was the question? Um, so we wanted to ask about the true indications of using systemic antibiotics. Now, there is a, within the systematic review from Tugos, uh, there was a weight mean difference of 0.48 in reducing the possibility for need of surgery. Uh, obviously, we know from the previous uh, literature, um, namely the uh, randomized trial by Mombelli, uh, on uh, reducing the need for surgery within system, systemic antibiotic patients, it didn't show a huge difference. So what are the true indications? Why are we using systemic antibiotics when we know that we will still need surgery? Obviously, the pockets are reducing, but on a patient level, there is still pockets. So if we reduce the pockets within a single quadrant and we still have some more pockets over there, we're still going to do surgery over there. So how can we justify this? Well, the Levin team, do you have an answer? Uh, yeah. So the answer would be like, of course, you still will have some pockets left in some quadrants, but the meaning of giving antibiotics is to reduce the amount of the deep pockets. So eventually you will do maybe surgery, but amount of surgery will be less in total. If anybody example, has any remark about it. Yeah. yeah, go on. So, like you see here, uh, one moment. No, we cannot really see it. Oh, yeah, okay. We cannot see it. No, can see, but you can explain. It's a bit difficult to switch back to your computer. Okay. Okay, uh, but was my answer clear or not? Yeah, your answer is clear. Okay, good. Yeah, it was other... clear. How, however, we would like to, I mean, I'd like to highlight that the the number of reduced surgeries is uh, definitely statistically significant, but how clinically significant it is, knowing all the side effects when it comes to uh, using systemic antibiotics and understanding the um, global implementation action plan by the WHO on to reduce the use of systemic antibiotics. So. When, when weighing this on a health, uh, risk to benefit ratio, is it worth it uh, yeah, to open a smaller flap rather than opening a larger flap and doing a proper surgery? If I may, I will try to extend one more time. Sorry, I was I'll try asking. to explain one more time. Can you hear me? You can answer, but not in Flemish, please. No, 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 no. we were just discussing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're not giving uh, antibiotics as purpose to uh, prevent surgery. We are giving antibiotics on, for patients which would think uh, they need more adjunctive because they're uh, difficult to get stable. And uh, the table that I showed was just uh, to show uh, what eventually would lead to residual deep sites when you have a, a win rate mean difference of 0 0.5. It's not because we want to prevent surgery, we give antibiotics. Okay. It's just to show what uh, the clinical benefit is when you have a uh, rated mean difference of 0 0.5 on residual deep sites uh, when you give uh, adjuncts like uh, antimicrobials. The topic of antibiotics is going to be probably an open topic all the time, and this is why the guideline is is uh, is specifically organized in such a way. Uh, I'd like to go to the next question. The next one coming from uh, from Dr. Yaniv Meyer. He's the, the president of the Israeli Peer Society. He was, his question was about the the use of lasers, uh, uh, meaning uh, and his his the question was, isn't it worth to use uh, the laser? I mean. How important is the consideration of the cost if you have a, a really additional benefit uh, uh, with it? So, uh, 
the question is, uh, do we have a real benefit when using lasers and uh, is the cost of the instrument uh, worth it? Which is an open question, I don't really know the answer. I think that uh, the lasers, uh, Mariano, was something that we we said is going to be a debate or discussed at this stage. Indeed, indeed. The, the, the main problem is the clinical trials, uh, and I think the student from uh, Bern uh, described them uh, very well, uh, have only shown uh, a marginal uh, benefit, very small benefit. Most of the studies uh, having a high risk of, of bias. Uh, and uh, therefore, with such a small marginal benefit, uh, I think cost of the technology is important. Uh, and in the same manner that with the antibiotic issue that we discussed previously, we have a lot of evidence of the significant benefit. I mean, there are more clinical trials in that area than in any other area. But we also have so much uh, evidence on the uh, health hazards associated with indiscriminate use of antibiotics that the, that's the beauty of a clinical guideline, that uh, uh, scientific evidence is one of the components of the recommendation, being uh, the other components uh, also important at the time of experts uh, providing by consensus a recommendation. And uh, these two recommendations, the one on lasers, the one on antibiotics, uh, are uh, in a way uh, conflicting recommendations because for some of us, having been involved directly in research on lasers and on antibiotics, uh, we may feel a bit frustrated that this uh, a benefit demonstrated in some of the trials is not considered at all. But on the other hand, I think we need to be sensible uh, to the other important aspects like uh, the cost or the health hazards uh, associated with uh, systemic antibiotic use. Professor Herrera, do you have any uh, input on this? Yeah, I, I, I just uh, follow exactly what uh, Professor Sand has said. Uh, one th in the systematic in, in the systematic reviews, most of the authors primarily deal with the efficacy, and only secondarily there were other factors included as adverse effects and and and, and economic issues because there's no uh, there's no uh, uh, objective evaluation of those aspects in many of the papers. So at the end, in a systematic review, you can conclude that the, what you have been evaluating, the, interve the evaluated intervention, it is, is showing efficacy. But then uh, this efficacy has to put in the perspective of all the factors that are listed normally in the background text associated with the recommendations in the, in the, in the, in the guideline document. And there are many factors involved, and I think these two are the perfect examples of how these discussions uh, are leading to a clinical practice uh, guideline within a clinical practice guideline sorry for a recommendation which is solidly based in many different aspects as mariano has said the systematic review on systemic antimicrobials probably has found the largest number of high quality randomized clinical trials uh, with a adequate duration even many of them over one year and the report the the, the efficacy was undisputable i mean the, the the impact was amazing in the meta-analysis however then uh, in the discussion with the experts and the stakeholders it was very clear that the the risk of using systemic antimicrobials and not for the individual patient which are not that high but for the society and for for community health it is very important and this is the reason that the recommendation was written in the way it was. For laser is a little bit different because the quality of the studies, or laser and photodynamic therapy, the quality of the studies and when, when the, the presentation from Bern was excellent but was not paying a lot of attention to the quality and the risk of bias and, and also the fact that many of these studies are split mouth studies 
the quality of the evidence is low, the efficacy is not very relevant, and then they have the associated cost that you don't need to do a very in deep analysis to realize that the cost of the traditional therapies is much uh, is much cheaper than the one if you have to invest your money in, in, in a laser. So this is the good thing and I think the perfect example of how we move from a six systematic review assessing efficacy to a clinical guideline in which, in which many other aspects has to be taken into consideration. But I would like to make a final comment on the issue of the systemic antimicrobials. So in the recommendation of systemic antimicrobials, possible use of systemic antimicrobials, uh, as adjuncts to, to subgingival instrumentation, there was a big concern about the use of systemic antimicrobials. But as Professor Teugels stated during the workshop, in most of the study in periodontal surgery with a regenerative aim, systemic antimicrobials were also used. So if those systemic antimicrobials are really necessary for those surgeries with for periodontal regeneration, then the same concern should have been uh, uh, written in the recommendation. So it's uh, it's uh, it was a little bit frustrating that the, we did not follow exactly the same uh, the same approach for both recommendations. But this is something that is normal, I guess, during during clinical guideline development because. Of course, there are many experts, there are many stakeholders, there are many reviewers that that are giving their feedback. And at the end, I, I believe that this is the best uh, possible clinical guideline. Thank you. There was one more question. I'd like you to end uh, by purpose. Uh, uh, Christina has asked uh, uh, Christina and Terry about, the question was about the clinical recommendation for SPT. Is it not too long, 12 months recall of the patient? And I will try to, to uh, enlarge the question a little bit. I mean, I know that sometimes uh, the spider web uh, says that 12 months, but really, is 12 months good enough in order to support the patients to reinforce their oral hygiene, not only to clean their teeth? And this is an open question. And uh, 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 well, maybe maybe the team from uh, from Aliyech can start. Yaman, you have an answer about that, or the others? Well, in the in the meantime, uh, yes. Morse, this is uh, Mariano, and yeah. uh, I think we need to question a little bit uh, the validity of the spider web, and this is something I have discussed with uh, Maurizio at length. And this is something that we have discussed in the workshop because uh, basically the validity uh, is based in two retrospective studies. Uh, and uh, some of the parameters uh, which are used uh, are not really risk factors, uh, but more risk indicators. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, it can be a nice guideline uh, or a nice uh, way to look at a series of factors that would influence but i don't think is a is a clear guideline to decide on uh, uh, regimes of, of uh, supportive care i think we need to look at the patient more uh, and to to look at some of the behavioral aspects uh, and general conditions of the patients uh, more than the, using a, a mathematical tool i fully agree with you I think this is the way we basically teach our students in other programs, more or less. One question I had for the, the well, more a comment than a question for the, the London group, which I think they did a very nice presentation. But some of the comments of the uh, uh, difficulties on utilizing preventive measures broadly in a public setting or even a private setting due to the costs. Uh, I think there are great examples and data from private practices that have focused fully on prevention and uh, have turned out very successful economical practices. And there are beautiful examples in Japan, 
beautiful examples in United States. So uh, it is very clear that uh, well-organized prevention pays uh, in the public setting because of the prevention of much more costly treatments on the future and in private settings because uh, if you have a huge critical mass of patients which are doing preventive measures all the time, uh, at the end, the economy will make it go through. So I don't think the economic issue is a very strong issue uh, to discuss the feasibility and, and the adequacy of a preventive approach for uh, the long-term maintenance of periodontitis patients. Well, Mariano, if, if I may, I mean, it's our experience, others, I think the problem is still, I, I, I kind of agree with, uh, with them because I think one of the problems of uh, insurance companies, if it's a private sector or the government, if it's a, it's a, it's a, a government supported, is that they, excuse my being very, very blunt, they don't pay enough for supportive therapy. I mean, the, remun the remuneration for the team is too low. And, oh, okay. uh, and it's not an incentive. I mean, on the long term, on the long term, both the government or the private uh, insurance company will pay more because the patients are going to deter deteriorate if they are not uh, supported. But uh, it's, it's a, I think it's a very big issue in many, many places, uh, uh, and it's well pointed in this. No, aspect. no, I, I, ag I agree that the situation it is like that, but I think it is our role to convince uh, both uh, the private practitioners and the public health authorities the opposite, because it's actually the opposite. So uh, I think even though the situation is exactly like you describe or our uh, student from London described it, we cannot say that it, it cannot be done, it doesn't work, because it may work if it is done properly. Okay, uh, we have uh, just a new question here. Let's just like, open the, the uh, slide. It comes from uh, uh, from the UAC, from it's a German from the Barcelona is asking about the uh, uh, subgingival instrumentation. And the question is, do we have just the options of doing it in four sessions? Well, I mean, quadrant wise or full mouth procedure? What about arch by arch? By arch? How long should we wait uh, uh, between them? Instrumentation. So I think it's Haifa has to. Haifa, yeah. Haifa, Haifa, yeah. Haifa has to answer. Mm -hmm. John? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I can open your mic. Yes. It's open. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So, what was the question again? If we should do it by arch or um, we should do it uh, with the interval between the session? We cannot hear you very well. You are very, I mean, so I think oh, you're Can you hear me now? No, we cannot hear you. Is this better? Well, if you're in a cave, yes, but otherwise not. It is getting worse. No, how do you do? It's getting worse? Yeah. I can write it down. Cannot hear very well. Okay. Let's, let's, uh, let it, my when when I saw it, it when I saw it, when I saw it, when I saw it, when I saw so, uh, David, you, do you think you may help them with this uh, question? I, can, can I comment on that? Yeah. Uh, in first thing, which is uh, very relevant, I think, in the what has been presented, it was it, it was uh, stated in the presentation, but maybe we need to clarify it further. So it was not what they did not assess full mouth disinfection in the in when they were comparing uh, stage versus uh, 24 hours deprivement so there was the there was they just included in that review the studies without antiseptics and this is a, has to be taken into consideration 
with regards to the to the staging or doing it uh, half mouth uh, there's there's no data on that i guess it's just most more on the on the timing uh, and the uh, relation between the first and the last uh, session of gingival instrumentation but of course most of the study uh, studies who have uh, designed a 24 hour approach what they are doing is half mouth in one day and half mouth in the next day and and then the staging the, the sometimes they do one per week sometimes they do once uh, every other, other week but those only for trying to to do a study of proof of concept but uh, most times i guess today uh, half mouth is done and then a period of one day to one week depending on how the the the, the clinic is organized how the patient is organizing their schedule is enough this this was also part of another workshop and the conclusion that uh, that the reasonable time be between the, the 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 whole all sessions could be between one week and, and ten days. So I, I think the the conclusions of the of the systematic review in this workshop and the clinical practice guideline is is given this more or less the same information that the all all options are feasible and and in the presentation from from HIFA I think they have analyzed. Uh, secondary factors that may help you in taking the decision, but most of these factors were very marginal factors. Or very, very few people will be affected actually by them, so it's not give, helping a lot in taking the decision on a daily basis. I just got a, a written answer on the chat from from John, and say they said that uh, there is no really scientific data, but as you said, the same uh, in Haifa, what they do. Uh, uh, they usually one to two weeks between uh, uh, to the sessions, uh, just in order to to be able to con better control oral hygiene and uh, evaluate the cooperation of the patients. So it's more or less what uh, has been answered here. Any other questions? Well, I have Maybe. one comment in in this sure. regard from from the Haifa presentation, which is not uh, that I am in disagreement, but I would like to qualify that. Uh, there was a recommendation or or a suggestion of a recommendation to use the full mouth uh, approach in uh, patients uh, with systemic diseases and i think there is data from dayuto and from filippo graziani that uh, this full mouth approach can cause a toxemia in the patients and and could be potentially hazardous so uh, i would a little bit uh, tame that recommendation because uh, uh, I think there is data that uh, the systemic impact of the full mouth disinfection approach is higher than the systemic impact than the staged uh, subgingival instrumentation. I think Mariano, this is this is actually written in the background test of the recommendation, and I agree with you. But if I, I got correctly the information from HIFA. In the slide, it was not very clear, but then they described that if you are under anticoagulants or some some uh, conditions that may require pre-medication, it would be better. It may be better if the risk of of uh, bacteremia is not relevant, then to do that in 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 one session. So in order to avoid to to to, to uh, ask the patient to take the medication, the pre-medication again and again. But uh, but you are completely right, and I think it is it is written in the in the guideline anyway. So, so the chat is opening again. Let me see what to say. Okay, but she has explained the same what what you just said. Okay. Any and I have a, I have yeah. more one one comment, uh, and of course yeah. this is an an editorial comment, uh, in the same uh, manner that uh, we recommended when we agreed on the new classification that we should forget about aggressive periodontitis. Uh, I think we should try to adapt to the new uh, guideline and uh, basically talk about uh, step one periodontitis treatment or step two or step three and uh, forget the the classical phase one therapy or basic phase of periodontal therapy because then it gets very confusing the difference between the steps of therapy the phases of therapy and i think uh, we all agree that uh, 
basic uh, periodontal therapy as it was understood was not basic at all. Uh, and I think that we should adapt to the new terminology. Okay. This was exactly one of the reasons that, uh, as we discussed when, when planning together this, uh, this uh, seminar, mm -hmm. is that we, the, the need to understand and, and to change a bit our, our mindset uh, in order to, to, to make what we're doing more medical, yeah. like with the classification. So this is, was, was one of the incentives that why we decided to have this, uh, this, uh, uh, this seminar uh, and then, to, of course, to, to spread the, the, the news uh, to, to all our clinical uh, uh, communities. Yeah, I cannot, I cannot agree more. I think uh, the, the use of the terminology for now should be consistent, at least among, among us. So we have one guideline, one guideline for so far, just one guideline. No guidelines, it's one guideline with many recommendations. Yes, we can say recommendations. And these recommendations are organized in step in a step by step approach in the four steps of the periodontal therapy therapy, the three steps with number, and then the supportive periodontal care that could represent the fourth step, although we will not use that. I, I believe that, and this is my belief, that like it happened with the classification. It will be, uh, especially for the younger uh, people that are the audience here, it will be easier for them to to uh, to uh, uh, absorb, to implement, and to to use this like like they do with uh, with uh, the classification nowadays because now it, it's it's so clear how to stage and grade. Uh, so I, I believe this is important. Okay, guys, it's afternoon. You probably need to go to your uh, siesta or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, or thank you, the, the the students, the panelists. You did a very, very great job, and uh, thank you, Professor Herrera, Professor Sanz, for being with us. And I want to thank you, the the people in the background, which is Candice and Sharon and the Monica. They did a great uh, uh, good job organizing this, this thing. And uh, keep safe, wear your masks, and keep your distance. Thank you, Professor Goldstein. Uh, thank you for uh, organizing this event, which is I think it's been fantastic. I, I have enjoyed the presentations and I think it's a it's a very good thing for the EFP and for the uh, postgraduate programs uh, to meet together and especially for this very relevant aspect which is the new clinical practice guideline. Thank you everybody. Bye bye. Good afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you very much Moshe. Thank you all.